All right, everyone. Well, I think we'll uh, get a start for our last talk of uh, the day by Lydia Bieri from Michigan, who will be telling us about gravitational radiation in uh, general space times. Lydia, please. Great. Thank you very much, Martin. So first, I'd like to thank especially Martin and also the local staff, Maureen and Alina, for putting in a lot of work and organized the conference and this program. So thanks a lot. Okay, I'll talk about some aspects of gravitational radiation in space times of um, certain general, of general decay. So first of all, of course, when we talk about gravitational waves, right? So the main general, uh, let's say, analytic geometric ap approach is studying a Cauchy problem for some, for the Einstein equations. And we look at some open set of, of manifolds of space time solving gas equations under some physical conditions. And then we'd like to understand, well, what is radiation for uh, space times that, that we look at? So we look at the asymptotics, the null infinity, and to try to read off gravitational radiation and also um, memory, which is a permanent change in space time there. So I'll report on some new structures. I mean, I'll give an overview of what has been known and there's some new structures arising. And I think um, there's interesting further questions related to that, that I will, uh, that I hope to give you at, at the end, some perspectives, what, what to relate that to. Okay, so first, uh, a little bit of overview of gravitational wave detection. We all celebrated the, 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 the LIGO's really wonderful, uh, first detection of gravitational waves in 2015. And since then, uh, the LIGO Virgo team has um, detected several gravitational wave events coming from mergers of black holes or mergers of neutron stars. So in 2017 was another interesting event where for the first time um, they uh, detected gravitational waves from the merger of neutron stars. And at the same time, there also the telescope uh, registered data for that. So the question is, well, we have these traditional kinds of uh, sources like black holes, stars, neutron stars, that you have a mass um, term that decays like one over R, et cetera. And the question is, well, what happens if these, let's say, sources are embedded into, a, for instance, a neutrino cloud? That's something that happens in astrophysics. Or you look at um, also the question is what happens when you look at galaxies, there's a lot of dark matter, et cetera. So is, what is the right right way to model something like that. So what happens if you have not a one over R decay, but something more general? Of course, I added the beautiful picture here of the Event Horizon Telescope. That's some local Harvard folk uh, also who work on that, uh, which is really uh, nice to see. So um, of course we look at the Einstein equations, but let me maybe say what I'm gonna talk about here. I will focus on the Einstein vacuum equations in general. So the structures I would like to uh, present are mainly really um, in the gravitational uh, field itself, but we can also add some uh, type of matter or energy on the right hand side. So you can say, well, neutrino radiation, for instance, or ne neutrino clouds around sources is also something that um, we would like to understand. So we model neutrino radiation here by some uh, null fluid on the right hand side. So we get the Einstein null, null fluid equations. All right, so um, all I'm gonna say is gonna extend to that. And there's also, if you have this null fluid on the right hand side, indeed you have some extra terms from this uh, null fluid that contribute to the picture. So as I said, I mean, you can uh, look at gravitational radiation for, with different tools in general relativity. And if you're a physicist or mathematician, you may have some preferences or different tools, but from the mathematical point of view, we study here asymptotically flat space times. I mean, of course you can ask the similar questions in cosmological space times, but for the moment, let me talk about asymptotically flat. And so we study, as I said, the initial value problem. So we have a, some open set of data, that we uh, solve the answer and equations for, and we get some open set of interesting solution manifolds, hopefully, uh, which really um, capture the dynamics of the gravitational field. So we like to understand gravitational radiation and memory uh, from, these, uh, uh, from these solutions. So um, for some of the younger folks in the audience, of course, we, have, we know that we have the constraint equations and the evolution equations for uh, the Einstein equations. And basically what I'm using here is some maximal foliation. So if I have an initial metric G bar, second so fundamental form K, so my so, uh, equations 
look like that. But let me maybe not stay too long with that part. I will just introduce some of the notation I'm going to use here. So if I choose some outgoing, L is going to denote some outgoing null vector field here. And L bar, the conjugate incoming one. So if I plug in GLL bar, that's going to be negative two. So basically, if I look at, for instance, S here, if I take a light cone, if you want, and intersect with a space like um, hypersurface, so I get um, a surface S, which is a two dimensional Riemannian manifold. Um, now, if I go outside, right, so if I generate the outgoing null geodesic, so um, I'm going to go in the L direction, I'm going to call this L or E4, this null vector fields. In the incoming null direction vector fields, I'm going to call L bar or E3. So typically, um, uh, I'll use this, uh, this frame, and we will complement things with an orthonormal frame on the surface, on tangential to the surface S. OK, now we'd like to, here is the same picture in a little bit of different framework. So what is going to be interesting for us, so there's a few geometric objects which really are at the heart of understanding gravitational radiation. So let's see, I mean, if you, I can define the corresponding outgoing and inward null, uh, the second fundamental forms and the outgoing are called chi, the incoming chi bar. And if I now take the traceless part of those, this is what we call the shears, the chi hat and chi hat bar, right? So it's different shears. And if I look um, at the traces of those, this is what we know as the expansion scalars. And I'm going to look, call this trace chi and trace chi bar. So we should keep in mind that some of these will, of course, uh, be important for radiation. So, of course, we are talking at future null, about future null infinity. So I solve, let's say, the Einstein equations for some physical initial conditions. And I look at the space times that uh, we derive like that. And then at future null infinity, I'd like to really read off what's going on in terms of gravitational radiation. So basically, this is just a summary of what uh, I said. But here is something interesting that I, I like to uh, rely on. So doing a Cauchy problem of this type. So of course, we have the, um, the stability results uh, from Minkowski space time, if you like. So we have some initial data, which is global, which are small in some weighted Sobolev uh, norms. So there, for instance, we had um, with the Christodolo Kleinman result or my extension or other people's results, if you look at if you have, this is really true for small data, right? You have small data in some weighted Sobolev sense, and you get a fully, uh, you get a full um, solution, global solution of the space time, which is complete, etc., in the way we want. Uh, but now the question is, what about large data? And now an interesting thing is that some of these um, proofs, the geometric proofs, um, if you look at what's going on at uh, towards null infinity, we can show that actually, even if you plug in large data now, so that's what you're interested in for gravitational waves. So then the, the main behavior along these null hypersurfaces towards future null infinity is uh, precisely given already in these theorems. And so this behavior is uh, independent from the smallness assumption. So let me therefore briefly review um, the data for two of the main stability results. Of course, the main breakthrough goes back to Christodoulou and Kleinemann in 91, where they proved the fully nonlinear stability of Minkowski space, where you have, again, initial value, uh, initial data, which is globally small in some weighted Sobolev spaces. Then they created a global solution, which is complete, uh, tending to Minkowski as well. So, um, then in the general line, there's many generalizations already for that result. The one I would like to talk about is I did a generalization of that a while ago, where we have the borderline case in terms of decay. Uh, I will tell you in the next slide what the decay rates are, what the data really looks like. But I have a um, generalization showing also if you have small data in those sense, we get a global solution, which is complete um, in causally geodesically complete. So again, the small data was important to ensure existence, of course. But now what about large data? And I'll give you an argument, in a, or i show you in a moment, that this uh, along uh, the behavior along the null hypersurfaces really is independent of the smallness assumption and actually also reflects very well the behavior of uh, what happens for large data space times. So here is the, uh, the, the type of space times I want to look at. So number eight and nine is initial data that um, if you look at the generalization of this uh, proof that I did, so we had initial data of this type. So first you have some space-like initial slice, and when 
r goes to infinity here. So your initial three-dimensional Riemannian metric has a form like delta ij plus little o3 of r to the minus one half. And correspondingly, correspondingly, uh, correspondingly of some decay for the second fundamental form. So in Christodoulou Kleinemann's case, their uh, metric looked like this leading order term of one plus two m over r, delta ij plus a tail like uh, that goes like r to the minus three halves. So of course, there's also um, there's various other space times in between here that you can look at. So for instance, I just name a, a, a more data. So you can look at something which is homogeneous of degree minus one. So your mass is uh, uh, inhomogeneous here, for instance. Um, you have data of dif uh, different decay rates, like in what I call C. And also basically, uh, the, the, the really, there's also one thing I call A type uh, situation, which is if you take my B type situation with little o, if you instead put in big O, um, that's what I call A. I have to say something about that in, on the next slide. So there's all kinds of different decay behavior and we can look at um, the solutions or initial value problem for this kind of data. So here, this is an important slide because as I said, we have stability proofs. I mean, um, by Christodoulou Kleinemann, myself, now and other people, but let's say if you, all these stability proofs, what we have small data, et cetera. But now for large data, it, you can show that uh, by a small, simple corollary, even for large data, now you can show that there exists a complete domain of dependence of the complement of a sufficiently large compact subset of the initial hypersurface. So what we get is that uh, the solution space time has a portion of future null infinity corresponding to all values of the retarded time u, which are not greater than a fixed constant. So what this means, so in terms of checking out future null infinity, we really get a solid foundation to investigate now the asymptotic behavior towards null infinity for these space times. Okay, also for large data. Okay, and maybe one thing. So the borderline case uh, data of type B that I just showed you, um, for which I did some, uh, which for which I, I showed some proof. So we have here still total finite energy and total, but the total angular momentum it diverges. If you look at the data of type A, if you replace the little o by big O, then we do not have energy which is finite anymore. And there's no existence theorem known for that type of data um, for development, which includes a portion of future null infinity. So uh, if I say something about um, type A, so this will be conjectures furnished with some supporting evidence. Whatever I say about B is relate or uh, relies on a, on a regular, on a rigorous proof and um, some portion of future null infinity for, for large data that we can say something about. Okay, now let's uh, decompose the while curvature into with respect to my null frame. And three, remember, is the incoming null direction. Four is the outgoing null direction. So I have uh, curvature terms like the alpha bar, which is like the one over R leading order term, et cetera. We'll see more of that. And if you look at uh, the crucible Kleinemann space time, so they obtained, so for instance, you have a one over R, R squared, R to the three, et cetera. Um, decay. If you put in much less decay, then you get up, um, you end up with what I got. So you have an R to the minus one, R to the minus two, and then everybody else here is kind of swallowed in a little R to the minus five halves. So if you look at that, of course, this um, leading order term doesn't have a limit at null infinity. But what's interesting, if you start digging deeper, there's some dynamical structures, and these dynamical structures underneath are going to really impact gravitational radiation, and there's something interesting to say about future null infinity. So here, we don't need to remember all of that, but some, let's say, Kai Hat and Kai Hat Bard, two shears, have some uh, very uh, significant decay behavior. I'll get back to that. The rest is probably not important right now. Okay, I get the usual equations. And so what I will work with here, the two main equations that will be important is really the Bianchi equation for rho. So rho is uh, a, a, an electric component of the Weyl curvature, same as a magnetic component of the Weyl curvature. So if I contract, let's say, twice with three incoming and twice with outgoing directions, that's going to be rho, and sigma is its Hodge dual. So if I have an index, so a lower three in some tensor, this means I have here I look at the slash is always a projection to the surfaces S, right, of the um, uh, derivatives D3 and D4 of some tensor. And if I have 
if I write Xi3, for instance, I mean, I take this projected derivative plus this term where S is the signature here of the trace chi bar times the tensor itself. So that's just some technical note. Okay, so here is something interesting to say about the dynamical and non-dynamical parts. So for instance, this is um, the following formula hold in for small as well as large data in uh, of the type P, so type B initial data. So if I have in the notation here, if I have this kind of uh, square brackets like R2 minus three halves, this means this is a term which is um, decaying like R2 minus three half, but which does not depend on U. So this is non-dynamical, right? So non-dynamical means it does not evolve with U. U is my retarded time. Okay, U is my retarded time here. And so tau minus is uh, just one plus U squared square root if you want. So tau minus you could think is, is like U. And so the curly brackets means I have terms which depend on U, so which are dynamical in the retarded time U. So when I go out to future null infinity, so these will also, uh, these curly bracket terms will have some limit and will evolve with retarded time u. So they are dynamical versus uh, the square brackets being non-dynamical. So let me explain something that happens uh, in a moment. So if you have smallness conditions, for instance, on curvature, so this is curvature component row and you have a derivative in the three direction. So uh, H is my, let's say initial space-like slice. So I have some smallness assumption if I, if I look at small data, which tells me, oh, I have to, I control these uh, integrals. So as a consequence, row three and sigma three, so the derivatives in the three direction, they have uh, terms of highest order, which is like R to the minus three, U to the minus one half. But um, so for small data, you can show it follows in my proof that row and sigma have um, a structure like given in 36 and 37, where the leading order R to the minus five half terms, which is a bad decay if you like, but this one is non-dynamical. It does not depend on you, okay? Now for large data, all kinds of other terms could occur. You, have, you could have terms at the level R to the minus five halves and U to the minus something. Alpha over alpha is positive. So there could be a lot of other terms which are uh, at the level R to the minus five halves, but with some U dependence in principle. So now let me explain. So something important and interesting that happens uh, in, with these space times. Let me explain that at the example of chi hat, but it's true, uh, the similar question is true for the uh, non-peeling parts of the curvature. So let us look at chi hat. Chi hat, like other quantities, um, are uh, defined locally on some surface STU, right? Our two-dimensional Riemannian surface sp uh, space. So they do not attain uh, limits at null. If you go out towards null infinity, you sit on a light cone or null hypersurface CU and you go out to null infinity. So then they do not attain limits out there. However, what we can look at, so the difference of the values. So let me take two neighboring light cones, CU and CU0. And of course I can take some intersection with some surface SU and uh, I'll, I'll, I pick a, a surface SU and a surface SU0. I pick a point on one and then the corresponding point on the other one. And so I can, in, I can connect these points with an incoming uh, null geodesic or null curve if I want. But if I look at now at the difference on these neighboring um, null hypersurfaces of, um, let's say, the values at these points, so that does tend to a limit. So for instance, for chi hat, right? If I take R squared times chi hat, remember chi hat decays like R to the minus three half. So this does not tend to any limit. However, if I now do that, right, I take two neighboring points on two neighboring uh, null hypersurfaces and go out to null infinity, then that does have a limit and the limit is exactly the following. So if I take the derivative of chi hat into the three, the incoming direction, and I integrate now from u zero to u uh, with respect to u, u prime, so then that's, uh, 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 that's a finite quantity and this is the limit that I get. So with other words, the part of the very slow decay R2 minus three halves is non-dynamical. As I said, it does not depend on U, but um, the derivative of this object does have a limit and actually have a nice integral that I can take here, okay? And the, I can do the similar construction with any non-peeling curvature component. And I can take off now these non-dynamical parts and dig deeper into the lower structures, the dynamical parts of these curvature components and Ricci coefficients. So there is more interesting dynamics to, to be understood. 
So we get some, um, so for the curvature, et cetera, we get some uh, limits at null infinity. So I'll use some of these results. And I only can say something about alpha bar and beta bar at the curvature level itself. I can say more at the derivative level for the other components. So they have some decay then in, in the retarded time u. All right, so here is something uh, quite interesting that happens. Now, let's look at the Bianchi equation. You don't see the structure here because I give you just a qualitative picture. We'll go back to the Bianchi equation in a moment. So if I take, um, let's say, the row curvature component and take a three derivative, then I have a bunch of terms. I will get um, other terms that I will see, that which also, that if you have large data, that might behave quite badly. So I have other terms that on the left-hand side, I take it on the left-hand side, which will cancel out in the Bianchi equation. We'll see that in details. Whereas on the right-hand side, I'll have all kinds of different terms of different orders that will impact gravitational radiation. So and what I call here rho one half or rho beta, these are terms, it's a collection of terms with different decay behavior that will now give new structures in, in the gravitational radiation picture. Okay, we can show then that for these, I'll give you the formula for that a few slides down the road, but we can show that for these uh, components on the right hand side, so we have limits at null infinity. So R to the three times, for instance, row one half has a limit I call capital R one half. And this capital R one half, like here in the second last row, um, decays like U to the minus one half there. And I have corresponding decay behavior of different type, like minus one plus beta, where beta is between zero and one half strictly. Okay, so there's some, new structures showing up that I will get to uh, in, a, in a moment. Let me now go back to the gravitational wave picture and say a few words, right? So when we have two black holes merging, they will send out gravitational waves. They go at the speed of light. They travel towards the, the product itself, the black hole or, so, or whatever it is, travels along their time-like um, curves. They send out gravitational waves along null hypersurfaces. And here is our null infinity where we do observations. So a few words also about here is where I think in the experiments, this is really nice to see where the simple, I mean, interesting, but also simple geometric equation comes down to an experiment like, so we model, let's say nearby geodesics uh, by the Jacobi equation, right? So how do we need nearby geodesics move? So we have the Jacobi equation, which gives us curvature on the right-hand side and some acceleration if you want on the other. And so LIGO does exactly that. It measures um, nearby how nearby geodesics move by putting test particles, which here are mirrors, uh, and following how these mir mirrors move. So this is done by laser interferometry, and uh, that's how it looks like. So the lower, or lower picture here is really this LIGO facility. You see here this L shape where they put these lasers and the mirrors. So LIGO, the LIGO Virgo collaboration. So then uh, Ray Weiss and Barry Barish and Kip Thorne got the Nobel Prize for their detection of gravitational waves. And I think this is really the beginning of some new era where we need to decode gravitational waves. There's a more mathematical structures hidden with physical impact. So I think we'll see more interesting um, secrets, secrets un unraveled in the universe where we need deeper mathematics to study that. Okay, very briefly, there's something interesting also in gravitational waves called the memory effect. So um, whereas LIGO has already observed what they call instantaneous displacements, right? The curvature comes through, the uh, curvature package, the wave comes, the curvature fluctuates, so the wave package comes through the detector. So this is what I call instantaneous displacement. So in a fraction of a second, you record exactly these uh, changes in, in, in the, geodesic position, so in the, in the curvature, if you want. And um, what is uh, also predicted, but not yet measured, ho hopefully they will see it in the near future, is the so-called memory effect, meaning that when a wave travels through a wave packet, so then the space-time will be per permanently changed, like indicated here with uh, these arrows. So this goes back in a linear, uh, linearized situation. There was Soldovich and Polnareff who studied for the first time uh, this memory effect and derived such a permanent change. It was believed then, because it's a small effect, um, it was believed that, well, it's hard to detect. But then Crisodulo in 91, in the fully nonlinear Einstein equations, he found uh, an effect 
also called, I mean, he found the memory effect, which is much bigger. For a while, people thought that this is just a linear and nonlinear part, but with Garfinkel, we showed that these are two different effects. They do the, th the same thing, but they are sourced by two different sources. So there's a lot of early work on uh, uh, memory by all these people. And there's been an explosion on memory works as a lot of people, I, I don't think I can cite everybody, but something interesting is also certainly a, a paper, a 16 by Lasky, Thrain, Levin, Blackman and Chen, who suggests that to see memory with LIGO, you could also uh, stack uh, events. Okay, so there's a lot of um, analogs. We found for the first time a memory analog for the pure Maxwell equations a few years ago, and there's a lot of ongoing research in, in all directions. So maybe let me say something uh, more to the point of this talk. So let me remind everybody so we can uh, decompose the wild tensor into so-called electric and magnetic part, right? So here, this is done in the first two formulas. So we have some electric and magnetic, electric and magnetic, magnetic part. And of course, we can um, write down the separation of, of geodesics, et cetera, like that. This is just a delta x here, and E is some, in, in the Jacobi equation, it's, a, it's some electric part that shows up uh, in, this, in the equation. So in my notation, let's say the NN, NN component of the electric field is what I call rho, and the NN component of a magnetic field is what we call sigma. So think of rho as the main, the important for this uh, purpose, electric component, and sigma is our main, uh, for this purpose, magnetic component. So in terms of memory, there's a whole uh, literature out there. So if you call uh, memory that is caused, let's say by um, electric curvature that only involves the electric part of the curvature is called electric memory. If memory um, involves the magnetic part of the curvature, that part is called magnetic memory. So far, if you look at any space time that decays like one over R, that's um, for instance, black holes, et cetera, any kind of mass that decays like one over R. So then we have um, that only the electric part of the memory shows up and the magnetic part is zero. There's no magnetic memory for these space times. So however, it's interesting if you go over the threshold of R to the minus one, just by an epsilon, then a whole new panorama of new structures opens up suddenly. And you can go to the borderline case of R to the minus one half decay and show that you not only you get magnetic memory, but you get a whole bunch of new electric and magnetic memory. And moreover, this memory is no longer finite, but this memory is growing. So what does that mean and how can we see that? Okay, so here is a rough overview of what's going to come uh, in more detail. So let me, um, oh, where did I have that? So here maybe one more thing, I have to explain maybe that uh, part a little bit. So when we, sorry, when you look at structures at null infinity, um, let me call the permanent displacement here, delta x. It's not a Laplacian, it's just a delta x. So that's a geodesic permanent displacement between the geodesics, right? In LIGO, for instance. So um, chi minus minus chi plus. So this, uh, this are, is now a geometric object related to uh, the shear at null infinity. If you have strong fall off, it's the shear itself. If you have less fall off, it's something related to the shear as we will see. So this is a, a geometric object related to the shear at null infinity. And this is the, when I let the retarded time u go to minus infinity, plus infinity, so I have this, uh, this difference this, uh, that I get. So now one can show that the permanent displacement of this test masses in a detector is given by exactly that uh, geometric object times, of course, uh, this is minus T zero over R. So T zero is just the initial distance between the test masses. So basically this um, geometric object really governs what's happening there. So what we want to do now is to understand really this chi minus minus chi plus because there's a lot of structure hidden behind that. Okay, so that's um, this slide. So remember now from the equation we just saw. So this object is related to the permanent displacement we want to study. Now this object will be determined by equations at null infinity. So these equations will include terms sourced by the electric part of the curvature. These are always present for all kinds of sources we know. At the same time, this will include terms sourced by the magnetic part of the curvature, which is only present for slow fall off. 
Now let me introduce some notation. So when we intersect some null hypersurface, let's say uh, CU at null infinity, it intersects at the, at the sphere S2. I'm gonna operate uh, on a sphere S2 at null infinity. So let me call C, for instance, the divergence of chi minus minus chi plus. So then I have an equation, which is the divergence of C, which involves structures of the electric part and the curl of C, which involves structures of the magnetic part. And there's a lot more structures than uh, that shows up for slow decay. So in the next few slides, let's go through the equations and, and recover these structures. So here are the Bianchi equations for the electric part of the curvature, the rho. I take the derivative in the three direction, which uh, the index three is just meaning I'm looking at this object, right? The D3 uh, of rho plus this. So on the right-hand side, so I have, well, beta bar alpha, et cetera, our curvature. Zeta is a torsion one form. Epsilon is another Ricci coefficient, psi bar two. But important for us are just the first two terms because the others are lower order. So I can write row three as minus divergence of beta bar, this curvature term, minus the one half chi hat times alpha bar plus lower order terms. So therefore I can, from let's say what we know now by the stability, stability results for small data, but also what it still holds for large data, we know that, um, well, the second term here has some bad decay behavior for, uh, so let's manipulate that a little bit. So the second term I can write as a, trace chi chi hat bar square component, which has a nice R to the minus three decay. But then I still have this component, which is the U derivative of the chi hat chi hat bar, okay? So this one, um, I now put on the left-hand side. So I have row three plus DDU of that part. And then on the right-hand side, I have something which has a nice decay behavior like R to the minus three. So obviously this means that uh, my left-hand side here, the, for, for large data, there could be all kinds of um, decay like r to the minus five halves and tau minus to the minus something, but they all cancel out due to the Bianchi equations here. And we know that the term on the left hand side decays now at the level, of course, of the right hand side, which is r to the minus one, u to the minus one half. Okay. So now let's take limits at null infinity. I multiply this now with r to the three, and this has all now nice limits at null infinity. I can take that and I call P3, this limits of, limit of the left-hand side at null infinity. Now I can integrate with respect to U from minus to plus infinity, this object. Then of course I will add a constant, but this will not uh, be important. This will um, fall, this will cancel out in, in our computations later. So we can rewrite the uh, limiting equations as number 48. So I have this limit P3, which is really what I write in 46 which is the limiting equation of the divergence of the beta bar curvature part plus the two chi uh, xi squared. So xi uh, squared, so this is really uh, what we call the news also at null infinity. All right, so what is the, but there's more structure. If you have um, one over R decay, then there's a very simple structure here. If you have less decay, there's much more happening. So there are all kinds of different structures. Let's look at this, um, these structures a little bit more closely. So I integrate P3 here with respect to U and we can show then that this uh, P object, so has now, uh, so this is again, tau minus is like U retarded time. So we have structures that grow in U. So there's structures, which I denote by curly brackets again, which have a grow, uh, growth rate like square root of U plus something at the level uh, with beta. So u to the beta, where beta is between zero and one half. And then I have and all these leading order growing terms come really from the curvature term. And then I have finite terms from the curvature and the shear and other things. So these are completely new structures here, which are growing when you have slow decay rate, they are not there, okay? So now I can look at the full equation. And so if I, I just compute the P3. So I take the full equation, um, uh, integrate from minus to plus infinity. And then this, I get this equation where I have the limits for P on the left-hand side. And I have here the shear squared uh, integrated as well. So this is the radi um, energy radiated to infinity. And then I have the divergence uh, of the diff of this uh, geometric object. Now there's all kinds of terms diverging at uh, square root of U, which shows up here. So, um, so we have this set of this equation we uh, put 
uh, aside for the moment. And now we look at the magnetic part. So we do the exactly same thing with the Bianchi equation for the magnetic part sigma. So I do the same thing and have here the curl beta bar, et cetera. And again, if I look only at the highest order, so I get an equation like 56, I take um, the, sh the shear part on the left-hand side, I can again decompose chi hat times star alpha bar into um, the component with lower decay and, and, and this shear part. So um, here, interesting for us again, so the right-hand side has a good decay behavior. On the left-hand side, the bad terms cancel out. So I can do the same. I can take the corresponding limit at null infinity of this equation. So that's what we do here. I call it Q3 for the left-hand side. That's the limit uh, at null infinity of this object on the left-hand side. And I integrate again with respect to U, so I get my object Q here. And again, the constant I get will um, cancel later on. So important here, our limiting equation is now this Q3 equals the curl of beta bar. And now we also investigate um, the structures. So this Q3 has all kinds of different structures. And now when we integrate, we get that Q itself has similar to uh, the electric part, the magnetic part also has uh, structures here in the curly brackets that uh, grow at the square, at square root of u rate and at u to the beta, where beta is between zero and one half. And um, these leading order terms are, um, are sourced from the um, in the curvature. Now, we also have this uh, finite part, which is sourced in the curvature and the shear part. So with that, we can go and compute the full equation for the magnetic part. And then again, we have here the curl, uh, the curl diff of this object here is now given by this uh, difference of the Q when we go from with U to minus and plus infinity. And again, we have a whole abundance of new terms at leading order, which is hiding behind this equation. So what we want to do next is the following. So let me just remind you again, what do I mean with diverging terms, right? So one thing we can do is, uh, if I look at this equation, so uh, I, if I look at 62, I can decompose that into different terms. I have the leading order terms here in the first component, leading order diverging at u to the one half. Then I have diverging terms a little bit less. So just u to the beta, where beta is between zero and one half. I have finite terms here, which give me the right hand side. Now, again, what do I mean by diverging? Let's um, think about this one more time. It's similar to what I explained a bit earlier on with the dynamical part, but here this is a bit different. So the behavior of this Q minus minus Q plus, as well as also that the same is true for the curl for the right-hand side of this equation 63, we now fix a point on the sphere at null infinity and on the sphere S2 at some fixed retarded time U zero. And then we can evaluate what is Q at U zero? So that's going to be some finite uh, value. Then we take a neighboring point. So we go, uh, we go a little bit further away. We take some other fixed U, not the same. And we evaluate uh, Q at the nearby uh, retarded time U, OK? So then we keep, let's say, U zero fixed, and we let U go to infinity. So then what happens is that now the difference of QU minus QU zero is no longer finite. So, but this difference is growing with square root of U. So that's what I mean by diverging. It's grow So this difference is growing with square root of U. And the same thing is therefore true for the right-hand side. Remember the right-hand side, we should think of the geometric object, which is reflect, we can see in the experiment directly, right? So the right-hand side is reflecting the permanent change uh, of the nearby geodesic. So this is also true, therefore, for the chi of u minus chi of u zero. So there's all these diverging terms, but then in the chi term here, there's some other interesting things. So this is finite, there's a finite contribution to the memory. But um, so these terms are rooted in the shear component. And actually it's interesting, as, as, as soon as you have a one over r decay, all of those components uh, decay in you, and there's no contribution from any of those. So um, they will not contribute to that. And so not only do we have magnetic memory, but we also have contribution from shear uh, suddenly at the finite level. 
Okay, and one more thing to emphasize. So if you have, again, asymptotic flatness like one over R or faster, then in number 63, not only is, is, is that zero, but each single term is zero. So each single term there is identically zero, okay? So what is new, we have magnetic memory. First of all, um, this curl equation is not, exists, is not, not trivial. And we have the growing terms with curl of u, other growing terms u to the beta and um, finite terms. So that's uh, the new structure. Now let's combine the two um, computations we have just done and find out what, uh, what this means. So a theorem we can state as follows. So this, uh, again, this chi minus minus chi plus, which reflects really the permanent change in my geodesics in the space time. So they can now be computed by the following equations. So this is, a, this is all at, at null infinity on S2. So we combine those. For that, let me write down things um, in this form. So we will use some nice Hodge theory to solve the problem. So this is on S2 at null infinity. So there exist now functions phi and psi such that I can write the divergence of this object like this, okay? So let me introduce some notation to make things a little bit simpler. If I call C the divergence of this chi minus minus chi plus, so then can I can write, I, we can uh, of course write that the divergence of C is equal to the Laplacian of the phi, whereas the curl of C is equal to the Laplacian of the psi and all slashed operators mean I'm on, on the sphere. So divergence C equals psi phi, it equals La Laplacian of phi, curl C equals Laplacian of psi. Now we have the system, uh, oops, sorry. We have the system from uh, 64, five and six. So again, what is called here C, the divergence of this object is given by this equation. Now I have, I collect from what we just did before. So the curl diff equation here, 65, right? This is equal to some Laplacian of Psi. This is given by this Q objects that we just derived for the magnetic um, Bianchi equation. I have the diff, diff uh, up, uh, equation, which is equal to a Laplacian of Psi on the other hand, which is um, sourced from the electric portion of the curvature. So Q is the, what's the left-hand side, right? So we have electric magnetic part of the curvature plus shear. P is the magnetic part of the curvature plus shear from the left-hand side. And in the electric part, I also have uh, energy which is radiated to infinity, which is basically the integral of the shear squared. So we have all kinds of new quantities. At, first of all, in both the equations, 66 and 65, they diver diverge at square root of u and uh, lower order. We have new finite objects. But again, if we study this um, hot system for stronger decay, then the curl equation 65 is completely zero. So each um, single term is identically zero. So there's no curl, no magnetic contribution. New is that we have that it, you, you go over the r to the minus one threshold and this opens up as, as soon as we, we land there. Okay, um, maybe just summarizing uh, from here. So I can summarize the following. So for space times where we uh, say we have an r to the minus one half decay as we just uh, introduced, we have new the magnetic memory which is growing at this rate. And so all the growing portions are sourced by the magnetic part of the curvature. And we have finite contributions from the curvature and from the shears. Again, shears would not contribute if you have stronger decay and there would be no magnetic memory otherwise. So there are further diverging terms. Then the electric memory also has the same growth of u to the one half and other growth like u to the beta as we have seen and it has far, this this is rooted in the electric part of the wild curvature and we have finite terms also that add up here from the shear so as i said right so we do have a curl equations for this very slow decay of the space time otherwise uh, we don't get any of that um really new i mean um really new is the magnetic part and the type of the of the divergence that we get here. Now, we can ask a similar question. So what I just did is uh, true for the Einstein vacuum equations, right? So let's think about this in, in some context for a moment. So um, 
There were some suggestions by um, Wald and Satish Chandran a while ago, if you plug in a very, very uh, complicated or very, very special energy momentum tensor in the Einstein equations, you may be able to, to get some magnetic memory of some form, not diverging or anything, but just finite. Um, but we don't know any field equations for that in some very, very special case. But now what, what we can show here is that actually magnetic memory shows up naturally in the pure Einstein equations, just Einstein vacuum. So it's, a, it's an, uh, a feature of the gravitational field, but it's only a feature when you go to slow decay. It's not there for, for one over R or better. It's there for slow decay, okay? So especially this includes space times, which are non-stationary outside of a compact set. So you could think of now, where does do these things happen in the universe? And let me uh, go to the next slide to give you some other uh, aspect. So this is a pure gravitational effect that we have shown. Now we can ask for some other um, matter on the right hand side. So let's look at neutrino radiation. We know from astrophysics, right? So neutrinos are, um, are almost, um, massless, they have some very, very tiny mass, but they travel almost at the speed of light, not quite, but you can show that um, things are uh, well approximated by modeling them uh, through a null fluid in the Einstein equation. So we look at the Einstein null fluid equations for that, and we can describe neutrinos in this setting. So the TNU nu has some uh, uh, structure like here. And interesting for us now is that, well, First of all, we recover also for the Einstein null fluid equations. You can recover all the geometric terms with the corresponding growth rate that we just um, showed, but there are now new terms contributing. So for instance, I didn't write this down in the slide, but from the stress energy T, there are some terms growing, sorry, growing at, uh, again, the same rate, square root of U. And so this adds up to the electric part of the curvature. So there's some growing term coming from there. And now something else interesting happens. So if you um, don't take the space times like little o uh, decay of R to the minus one, like in, in the B space times, but you allow for capital O, for which I told you, we do not have a stability proof for those, but um, we have some evidence for certain, let's say, physical properties, et cetera. So if you uh, take um, a space time where I replaced a little o by a big O, something else interesting happens. Uh, I didn't write it here, but you have an extra term from the T. So there is a curl term from the energy, uh, from the stress energy T mu nu showing up. There's a curl T that also starts growing at the square root of U and contributes to the magnetic memory. So there's no, um, T component in the magnetic memory for the B for the B data, but there is for this A data where I have capital O um, of R to the minus one half there. So there's a lot of interesting questions. So I mean, if you think about neutrinos, right? You think of let's say if you have neutron star mergers, you think that the source is embedded in a huge neutrino cloud. And um, so this should affect so also um, the gravitational radiation at the memory in some sense. So you have, um, whereas in some situations you might have a good uh, description, let's say, of the source by thinking they are really in some vacuum, but very often your um, sources might be in, in some neutrino clouds, which extend over very, very um, uh, long parts of the space. And so for that, so this is a model uh, that would really fit well with, with this picture. So what I show you here would uh, model such an um, such a astrophysical situation of this hugely uh, extended neutrino clouds. Um, let me tell you a few more remarks. So first of all, the gravitational wave sources where we have this neutrino halo would be um, a perfect um, description for that. But there's some other interesting questions. Now, we can think of dark matter and certain types of dark matter, we don't know much about that yet, but certain types of dark matter may also have a, uh, let's say, may behave a little bit like, like neutrinos or, or similar, or may behave uh, according to the laws of, of, of what I just showed you. Especially here, when we look at galaxies, we know that um, galaxies have huge halos, including dark matter, right? So we have these observations of the rotation curves, et cetera. And you, one can compute that they might, these dark matter halos extend much, much further out of the galaxy itself. 
So another question I want you to do that I'm looking at with uh, David Garfinkel also is, well, how can we model now uh, this dark matter halos or uh, halos of, of galaxies? And can we explain some of, uh, of that um, with the model that I just showed you or uh, an adapted model? It turns out that some of the decay rates I just presented to you, which are very slow, have some, um, let's say, correspondence when you look at these dark matter halos. So there's something interesting to say there. Um, then you, of course, want to couple the Einstein equations to some other types of stress energy, matter energy fields that uh, ask similar questions. In the cosmological setting, again, there's something interesting happening. So we're looking at some questions there. So you can say, well, in a cosmological setting, do we know certain regions that have some all kinds of different decay behavior? And if you look at gravitational waves coming from cosmological sources, so do we see some imprint in the wave or the memory of where they traveled through? And this inhomogeneity, of course, has some imprint, as we showed with Garfinkel and Eunice in, in a, a while ago. But the questions are, so do these uh, very slow decay structures also show up and, and can we find, say something else about sources here? So there are many more fascinating questions. And let me stop here.